Well, good morning, and uh, th this is uh, probably uh, a rare Sunday that you are uh, at home and not worshiping with us at the church building uh, in Baldwin. And uh, if it's odd for you, it's equally as odd for me. I'm preaching essentially to uh, an empty building. It's just me and Dwayne here. Uh, doing this, but we're doing this because uh, we want to move on. The, the, uh, that our, our mission, we've been saying, isn't tied simply to a building, um, but we are the church. And even if we can't meet together in a building, we're going to keep preaching the word and, and uh, we're going to keep doing uh, what we can to move our mission forward. And so, um, and so let's get started. I hope that you're ready to go uh, this morning and uh, turn to Romans chapter 5. And I've got to have to get in the habit of looking up more. I, I, and you'll probably see me going back and forth here and, and not getting good eye contact with you. I will work on that as we, as we go. But uh, old habits sometimes are tough to break. Um, we've been studying through the book of Romans. And uh, it's one of the most important books in the New Testament because it contains so much information about God's plan for humanity, why the cross mattered so much. And it's such a great book, but it's not always easy to comprehend. There's some inside language that we have to learn to discern when reading the book of Romans, don't we? The Apostle Paul, who is the author, he uses words like uh, circumcision and justification and atonement. And, and so it takes a little bit getting used to. But that's typical in life. That happens a lot. It, ha it happens to people who are, are new at church. We use words sometimes that people aren't always familiar with if they didn't grow up in a church words like tithes and offerings and unspoken prayer requests and um, fellowship hall and, and all different sorts of things and of course if you've got teenagers in the home by any chance you've probably had to learn some some inside language as well my my kids use words all the time that I need to get an explanation for because I don't even I don't either know the word or I don't know how it's being used. You know, they say things like bet and sick and lit and all sorts of different things. And even for, for probably all of us, if you have a cell phone at all, we've had to kind of get used to sort of some new language in texting, right? Um, how many of you, uh, did it take a while to even know what LOL meant? Probably for some, it took a little bit. I, I Probably a year ago, probably maybe two years ago, I was texting one of my aunts and and she said something funny, and I just wrote back, uh, LOL. And she responded to me uh, by saying, I love you too. She thought LOL meant lots of love. Uh, I heard about one mother who thought LOL meant lots of love. She sent her daughter a text message telling her that her grandmother had, that had died. And then she wrote LOL at the end of that. So there's all, you know, we're, we're sort of all kind of learning some inside language. You've probably had to learn some maybe some other initials as it pertains to texting, TTYL, you know, talk to you later, WYD, what are you doing? Um, you know, I, uh, M-H-O in my humble opinion, I see why am I in case you missed it. Jenny sends me this one all the time. Y-T-G-H-I-T-W-A-I-S-L-T-H-Y. And that's short for you're the greatest husband in the world and I'm so lucky to have you. Well, she didn't. She didn't really. She hasn't sent that one to me actually, but but I know I know she will someday. Well, today we're we're continuing this study from this great letter, and we're going to see Paul move from defining some you know some inside language that's, that's sort of tough for us to understand to now show us why all of this matters, and we're going to see that it matters because it's the difference in having a relationship with God versus being his enemy. And if you hear that and you think, whoa, 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 what do you mean that I am an enemy of God? Well, those aren't my words. Those are the words of Scripture. And so how does a person go from being an enemy of God to actually one of his children? And that's what we're going to see today as we study Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 1 with me. Paul writes, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, I've told you this at some point already, but anytime you see the word therefore, you need to see what it's there for, right? And this is a conclusion statement where Paul's wrapping up the point that he's been making all the way up until now. And so Paul says that in light of everything that we've talked about up until this point, The fact that you can't be justified by the law. The fact that you can't be good enough to have a relationship with God on your own. He says we're all messed up, all depraved. That even religious acts like circumcision, even though that's good because you're being obedient, that can't save you. Our works, our morality, our religion, they all fall short of the standard of God. And so now he says that in light of all of that, What do we conclude? And his response is, we are made right with God by our faith in Jesus. And the wonderful result of that, at least one of the wonderful results of that, he says in verse 1, is peace with God. The fact that that we have been justified by our faith in Christ, we now have peace with God. Now, if you remember justification that's a legal term meaning that God has removed the guilt and penalty of our sin by the death of Jesus that not only because of Jesus's death are we forgiven but God actually gives us his righteousness an incredible trade maybe you think about justification like this have you ever typed out a document and if you've typed out a document you know that the left column is always justified by default. That all the letters line up perfectly down the left side of the page. But the right side, by default, is unjustified, right? And so the letters don't line up a- at all. And, but this is what faith in Jesus does. It justifies us. It aligns us perfectly with God. And we don't click a button to make it happen. We can't do anything to make it happen other than trust the work of Jesus that who, and God justifies us as a result. And again, notice the language that Paul uses here. He says that our justification has given us, check this out, peace with God. Now, this isn't the same as having the peace of God. There is a peace that God brings to his children. There's a peace even now in the midst of everything that's going on with this virus that we can have. We can find peace even in the midst of unpredictable times. And that's an incredible benefit of knowing Jesus. But that isn't alone while we follow him. I mean, sometimes people will think of religion only as kind of this therapeutic peace that someone has, right? And so they think, well, that's fine if you get that peace with Christianity, but I get it doing yoga or taking a walk or essential oils or drinking beer. You know, I don't know. But that's not what following Jesus means. Faith is so much more than a feeling. There's going to be times in your life that, yes, you feel close to God. There's going to be moments when you're going to be able to praise him for peace in the midst of a storm. But we don't just have the peace of God. More importantly, Paul says that we have peace with God. And that's completely different. Peace with God means that the state of our hostility is over. It means that we are no longer at odds with God. Now, if you're new to church at all or Christianity in general, that might be surprising to hear. You may be willing to say, whoa, whoa, what do you mean, preacher, that I have hostility with God? David Thurl was a humanist. He was asked one time if he had made peace with God, and he replied in humanist fashion. He said, I didn't realize that we'd ever quarreled. Well, you may not feel like you're at odds with God, but that's exactly what your sin does and if you're not sure if you're a sinner we'll just go back and read romans chapter 3 and and i know this sounds harsh but your sin puts you at odds with a holy god and even makes you his enemy that's what paul's going to say here in just a few verses tim keller puts it like this he explains it like this he says when we disobey god two things happens first you not only break his law 
but you assume the right or the authority to do so. He says, you're claiming to be in authority and the king of your life. But he says that God claims kingship over the same thing. And so what happens when two kings claim the same thing? You have a conflict, right? And this is what we've seen in our lifetime in Israel, right? You have Palestinians and you have Jews who have a claim possession of the same land. Both believe that the land is rightfully theirs. And so what? They've been fighting about it for years. And so if both you and God are claiming kingship over the same thing, guess what? There's conflict. And not only that, but Keller reminds us that our disobedience means that God has a problem with us. It's not just that we are hostile toward him. Paul's already told us in Romans 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, that God's wrath is upon us. Our sin puts us at odds with the holy God, and we can't do anything to make that right. This has been the message of Romans since the very beginning. This is where Paul is going. This is why he's concluding it like this. But the good news is this. When you wave the white flag of surrender and you trust Jesus not simply as your Savior but also your Lord, the war is over. And Jesus justifies you. He makes you right with God through your faith. And the result is peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what else justification does. Look at verse 2. We have peace with God through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And so not only does the justification of Jesus bring us peace with God, but check this out. It gives us access to Him as well. And this is so much bigger than simply being absent of conflict. The word here that Paul uses, it carries this idea of bringing near or bringing close. How many of you follow the, the royal family in England? I can see you raising your hands right there in, in your living room. I see that. But, you know, you watch the weddings. You're interested in the gossip or the tea. That's what the young people would say. And I don't pretend to, to know much about anything about the royal family. I don't follow them. But, but I'm not aware of any earthly king or queen that grants full access to their people that they rule, right? Queen Elizabeth resides at Buckingham Palace. But it's not an open-door policy to the people of Great Britain. They can't just show up and have a, have a cup of tea with the queen. They, they don't have access. But do you know... Who does have access to the queen? The prince. Charles can walk into the palace anytime because Elizabeth isn't just his queen, she's his mom, right? They have a special relationship that's only shared between a parent and a child. And that's the covenant that our Heavenly Father now shares with us. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was off limits to the people of Israel because of sin. And there was a curtain in the temple that served as a visible reminder that the, of the separation between them and God. And the gospel writers tell us that at the very moment that Jesus died on the cross, the curtain was torn from top to bottom, signaling that the throne room of God was now accessible not just to Israel, but all who would believe. And so because of Jesus, we have access to God. We are invited into a relationship with Him. Let me give you one more example. I'm going to ask you to take your political bias off the table for just a moment. And I don't have the picture. I can't show you. But you've probably seen the famous picture of a young John Kennedy playing under the desk at the Oval Office where his father at the time was the president. That's a picture of privilege. That's a picture of standing in grace. That's a picture of freedom and confidence that only comes through that relationship. Now, if you get caught 
under that desk, you're going to jail, right? I mean, even if you have a relationship with the president today, if you're crawling around and snooping around in that office looking through drawers, your privilege is going to get denied really quickly. But if your father's the president, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? Listen, the justification of Jesus has given us access not to just some worldly leader who will come and go, but to the king of the universe who remains forever. And so justification not only puts us at peace with God, but it brings us into an intimate relationship with Him. And do you notice what else it does? Look at the end of verse 3 again. He says, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. See, the justification of Jesus brings us hope. Now, when we think about the word hope, it's kind of a weak word, right? I hope. Uh, I pass the test. I hope she says yes if I ask her out. I hope my team wins. Of course, there's no sports right now, so you don't have to worry about that. But the word that Paul uses here is stronger. It brings conviction. Our future hope in heaven is not based on wishful thinking. It's based on a conviction of truth. See, this is the key difference between Christianity and every other world religion. In every other world religion, you work for what you hope to achieve. But there's no guarantee. It's just wishful thinking. But Christians, we celebrate the hope that we have that was achieved for us by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if you've put your faith in Christ, your salvation is secure, your hope is certain. That's why Paul says, we boast. We can brag about that. We don't brag about anything we've done. We haven't done anything. We boast in the cross. We boast in Jesus. And because of that confidence, because of our conviction, we can deal with whatever life may throw at us. Even what is thrown at us now in these very difficult times. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Don't lose sight of your hope, church. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. And then incredibly, notice what he says in verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who He has given to us. Did you notice what this assurance does? It means that because of our confidence in Christ, we can even have hope in our sufferings. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the Word of God isn't applicable for today. This is a time of great trial. This is a time of uncertainty. Some people are suffering because of this this virus. Many people more, perhaps, and we pray that that's not the case, but likely will. And while we may be tempted to question God or even doubt his goodness he uses suffering for our benefit J.D. Greer illustrates it like this he says suffering in the believer's life is like the cold that triggers your heater to come on you have a set point he says and when the temperature in your house drops your heater cuts on and all this wonderful air starts pouring out the vents The cold temperature, he says, doesn't make the warm air, of course. Your heater does that. But the cold temperature causes the heater to kick in. And he goes on to say, this is how faith works. Suffering makes your faith kick in and pours new experiences of trust and confidence and even joy in God in the cold of suffering. And the colder the temperature gets, the hotter the furnace gets. Has that been your experience? I know that it has because many of you have told me that that's been your experience. And it's not that any of us want to suffer, but suffering doesn't defeat us. Christians see suffering 
through a totally different lens. It produces perseverance and character and hope. It narrows our focus and it puts our life in perspective and it kicks our it kicks in our faith like never before in fact if you're even if you're suffering i mean even if you're going through a trial even if your health is failing even if you're lonely even if you're dealing with with mental illness even if the relationship is over even if whatever it may be in an incredible way the Apostle Paul says, and this is, a world, this is a way that the world can't understand. You can actually thank God for difficult times and trials and suffering because it's producing perseverance and character and hope in your life. And at the end of the day, we know that no matter what happens, the end result is the same. Hope of the glory of God. D.A. Carson says like this, I'm not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. And so no matter what you go through, we know how this story ends. We know that we have victory. Ever now and then, the, one of those sports channels will show uh, like an old Kentucky basketball game. And of course, I don't like those games when we lose, even if it was a classic, I'm probably not watching that. But one of my favorite games of all time happened in 1998. Kentucky was playing Duke in the Elite Eight for a chance to go to the Final Four. And I remember that game so vividly. I remember where I was at. I remember what I was doing. I remember being so nervous with every possession. Kentucky fell way behind. My heart was pounding. I was on the edge of my seat. Duke had beaten us five years earlier on that dumb Christian Leitner shot, and I wanted to beat them so bad. I was a nervous wreck. And, of course, we went on to win that game and national championship that year. But when that exact same game gets shown now, and I see the replay of it, you know what? I'm not nervous. I don't scream at the TV. I'm not fussing at the officials. My hands aren't sweaty. I can sit back and watch that game with no worries. You know why? It's because I know the outcome. And the same is true with our walk with God. We know the outcome. We know that no matter how bad it may look, no matter how bad our team is getting beat, the end result is a win because the end result is a resurrection. And there's not anything going on in your life that that can't fix. Look at how Paul says this is possible in verse 6. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, Romans 5, 8 is one of the very first verses I ever memorized. I think I had just graduated high school, and I had some Christian gear. I had a hat that had a cross on it. I had Romans 5, 8 on the back, and I was, I was going to wear that to a, a large uh, amusement park uh, in Cincinnati called Kings Island. And I thought, you know what? I need to make sure I know what that verse says in case somebody asks me. And so I, I memorized it. I'm glad I did because it's such an important verse. And I certainly didn't understand the extent of what it meant at that time. But verse 8 really captures the message of the gospel so well. God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. Yeah, sure, somebody might die for a friend or maybe a family member, but Jesus didn't freely go to the cross because you were friends. You were actually his enemy. Imagine if a terrorist murders one of my children and, I, and was being sentenced to life in prison, and I show up at the trial and I offer to take his place. And not only to take his place, but to give him all of my possessions so that he could go home and be with his children and start over. And you say, well, who would do that? You had to be out of your mind to do that. Who would do that? I'll tell you who did that. God did that. He did that to make us his sons and daughters. Verse 9, since we 
have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Here we go, verse 10. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? And not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. See, the judgment of God was upon you. You were his enemy because of your sin. You were, you know, you had this conflict of dueling kingdoms. You were alienated from God. You couldn't do anything to make it right. You didn't do anything to make it right. But now Paul says, through your faith in Jesus, that you have been justified by his blood and saved by his wrath. And then he says this. He says, look, and if God did that while you were his enemy, just think of the good things he has in store for you as his child. And the greatest part of that on this side of eternity is what God has done for us by sending us the Spirit. Look what he says in verse 5. Paul makes reference. He says, Hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the first time that Paul has mentioned the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. He'll speak more in depth later in, you know, in the later chapters about him. But since we have gone from being God's foe to now his friend through Jesus, he deposits his Spirit into your heart life and don't miss this this is huge the very presence of God which was off limits previously doesn't just hang out around us doesn't just show up in the building when we're in it he moves into our lives and we become the temple of God and that's how a living room today can be transformed into a church the church was never about a building anyway. The building is just where we assemble. The people, the church is the people of God. And if you've placed your faith in Jesus, God has moved into your life. Robert Morris says it like this. As Christians, we have someone uh, living within us who is God. He has the mind of God. He knows the will of God. He has, knows God's feelings. He resides within us because he wants us to help us think the way God thinks, desire what God desires, and feel what God feels. What a privilege. And amen, what a privilege. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall 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 we be saved through his life? Where's your hope at this morning? Some of you are hopeful because you're just an optimist. An optimist is, optimism is just this assumption that tomorrow is going to be better just because it's tomorrow. I hope it is. There's no guarantee. Some of you are hopeful because you think, well, whatever doesn't kill me, makes me stronger. But there's some, some things in life that can hurt you really, really bad. And regardless, one day your, your body's going to stop and you will die. At some point, it's not going to make you stronger. It's going to make you dead. Some of you seek hope by medicating through drugs or alcohol or materialism or sexual pleasures. But your soul was not designed to feed on those things, and those things will never give you permanent satisfaction. Paul said, my hope is in a God who loved me enough to die for me, even when we were enemies. My hope is in a God who reconciled the broken relationship that we had and even gives me confidence in suffering. I hope that that's where you'll place your hope today. Would you pray with me? Father, even today, as our folks are watching this in the living room and they're assembled in, uh, in families or just individuals, Lord, my prayer 
is that they are reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus. And Father, we give you praise for that. Even in the midst of uncertain times, we worship and honor you. And may the sacrifice of our praise be pleasing unto you. We thank you that you have made us your children. And it's all possible through the justification of Jesus and his blood. You have made us righteous. We thank you. We give you praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.